Hello again. Uh, this lecture is entitled Chronic Prostatitis. It's not always an infection. Uh, the reason for this uh, specific title is that so many patients um, are given a, a diagnosis of prostatitis. Uh, they're empirically started on, uh, on antibiotics, uh, but the antibiotics, yes, in some cases work, but in many cases, they're not working at all. Uh, and patients need other forms of care. And that's really what this lecture is devoted to. The symptoms of chronic prostatitis, what we now call CP, CPPS, chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, include uh, things like pain at the tip of the penis. And of course, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, uh, the pain usually is, isn't at the tip of the penis. It's usually way back, uh, either by the prostate or by the pelvic floor muscles. Uh, there can be perineal pain. This is pain between the scrotum and the anus. The testicular discomfort, urinary hesitancy, uh, the sensation of incomplete emptying, pelvic pressure, constipation, all some of these symptoms don't even sound particularly like the prostate at all. Uh, and in fact, some, some of the patients come in with uh, a lot of bladder related pain. Uh, and in, it's not infrequent that we ultimately make a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis. Well, the symptoms continue on and a large part of them may be related to sexual dysfunction. That can be in the form of erectile dysfunction, the inability to attain a, 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 a reasonable uh, hardness and firmness for uh, penetration, premature ejaculation, ejaculatory pain, and even changes in libido. Well, Chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain uh, syndrome doesn't only have, it's not just the, the symptoms that cause problems, it's the result of those symptoms in terms of social functioning, in terms of stress, depression, anxiety, and so forth. So we really need to keep this in mind what toll it takes on, on our patients. Well, let's back up for a moment. Let's talk about some prostate anatomy. And as you can see here in this, what's called a sagittal view, a cross-sectional view, the prostate gland over here sits right underneath the bladder. Uh, and on the other side is the rectum. The other side is the uh, sort of the root of the, of the uh, penis and all the uh, structures that allow one to uh, attain an erection. Lots of muscles over here that you see here around the, the rectal area and also muscles that control um, ejaculation. Here you see this on a side view. This is called the coronal view, the prostate over here, and these muscles called the levator ani musculature also. So in, being in such cl uh, close proximity and the fact that the uh, nerves that run in this area also affect the, the, the muscles, uh, the prostate and the bladder, it's sometimes hard to figure out where the pain is coming from from. Prostatitis syndromes can be broken down into different categories. And uh, not just for the sake of simplicity, I just want to make mention that most patients that we see in practice and over, worldwide essentially uh, fall into category three, what used to be called non-bacterial prostatitis or prostatidinia. The ones that typically everybody thinks about are the first two categories, acute prostatitis and chronic bacterial prostatitis. These categories represent maybe only about five, maybe 10% of patients, um, but they use, most of these patients will have some history of a documented urinary tract infection somewhere along the way. That leaves us with a dilemma because it means that most patients are not going to respond or minimally respond to antibiotic therapy. So as I mentioned earlier in an earlier lecture, we need to sort of break down the symptoms and where this pain is actually coming from because it may not just be the prostate. And this is, a, uh, a, this is something called viewpoint. It's a way to uh, essentially uh, break the pa patients down phenotypically, meaning by what we see, how they present to us, whether it be urinary complaints, uh, whether there's, for example, the N stands for neurologic dysfunction, T stands for tenderness of the muscles, and a new one over here, not just U point, but U point stands for the sexual dysfunction. And we need to address many of these factors when uh, sort of uh, evaluating patients and ultimately developing a treatment strategy. One of the major players that we see in the majority of patients is some type of 
muscular dysfunction. And this slide really just goes to show the complexity of this area. So here you can see the phallus here, the anus over here, and all the structures nearby. So you see the nerves that come right over here. You can see its association with these, what we call the ischial tuberosities or the sit bones. And you can understand perhaps why patients don't really uh, care to sit down for long periods of time. It, it worsens symptoms for so many people. Maybe it's because we're compressing this nerve of the perineal nerve into the, that, these bony structures here. Maybe it's just the fact that we're put, applying pressure to the nerves and the muscles in this area uh, to cause discomfort. And often on physical examination, we are picking up tenderness in many of these regions, tenderness that we can then hopefully apply some therapies to. One of the basic therapies that we typically uh, apply, and uh, my patients listening uh, today will definitely, they've heard this before, is the you need to stop pushing and straining. Many people come in with some urinary hesitancy or they're just tightening up there all the time because they're in pain, so they guard, they, they, they tighten up more. And that seems to worsen this whole cycle of pain. We need to watch out what we're doing in gym, not in the gym activities because we don't want to inadvertently recruit those muscles and tighten them up and cause more discomfort. At least temporarily, we want to stop doing that. And certainly no Kegel exercises. We want to do the reverse of Kegels. We want to relax those muscles. We want to make sure, remember we talked about the bowel uh, bladder connection. We want to make sure that, the, uh, that there's no constipation present. Um, and we want to apply usually some heat to that area. We have patients in the bathtub often twice a day, especially when they're not feeling well. And it does seem to relieve uh, some of the discomfort, relax the muscles. And to that point, we also, not in all cases, but often apply skeletal muscle relaxants. Really the corner uh, stone of therapy is physical therapy where specialized physical therapists intervene. And I can tell you again, profound improvements for many patients using very simple uh, techniques and devices as you can see over here. I mentioned muscle relaxants, and you can see a whole wide assortment of different types of agents that have been used. We often use diazepam, either in pill form or in uh, rectal suppository form. Um, but the, the, and this is a controlled substance. Uh, we tend to use it only because it does tend not to, it tends not to cause a lot of fatigue. Uh, but there are lots of other options available uh, in, in practice. But I really think the take home message here on this particular slide is not, are not the medications themselves, but the fact that they're only going to take the edge off. None, no skeletal muscle relaxant will zip into those pelvic floor muscles uh, and take away pain and just relax those muscles. Uh, they're going to hit all the muscles of your body. So in order for us to really relax them to a significant degree, we'd have to relax all the muscles of the body and then you'd be so fatigued you wouldn't be able to function. So it's essentially, I always tell patients, it's like baking a cake, it's a little pinch of this, it's a little pinch of that. The muscle relaxants are helpful, but you gotta do all these other things because the muscle relaxants alone, I don't think are the way to go. And also you don't wanna become just I need to continue on and on and on. You would like to use muscle relaxants more or less on an as needed basis as opposed to taking them all the time if at all possible. When the, the, when the level of discomfort really is not we're, not, we're not getting there. The patients are either plateauing or we need to do something a little more aggressive. Sometimes we will reach out to injecting those areas with anesthetics. Uh, we can, uh, Botox has been used. Uh, but essentially, the, 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 the take-home message here is that we can inject the specific muscle groups and or the nerves in the area to sometimes calm things down. And sometimes these injections can give patients uh, hours to days to weeks to even months of, of pain relief. Well, sometimes simple therapies really work well for patients. You don't have to uh, always attack muscles and the prostate directly. Uh, oftentimes, just dietary changes can have a great impact. And I just wanted to bring to your attention the similarities often found between interstitial cystitis of bladder pain syndrome and CPCPPS, the chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, how simply spicy foods, acidic foods, uh, alcoholic beverages and so forth seem to uh, 
worsen symptoms for not everybody, for, but for many patients. And sometimes dietary changes are reasonable to, to move forward with. Um, on the converse side, uh, you can see that there are some uh, medications and, uh, and dietary supplements that can help improve uh, some of the discomfort. Interestingly, many of them are directed towards improving bowel function. And you can see again that bowel bladder or pelvic uh, pain connection. Medications that are, are available for prostatitis type syndromes uh, go from nutraceuticals like quercetin, which is a bioflavonoid, uh, to bee pollen, all the way down to more traditional medications such as alpha blockers, medicines that are typically used for prostate enlargement and blockages, to uh, uh, tadalafil, which is a, a medication when used in low doses. Uh, improves erectile dysfunction, to infl anti-inflammatories, as we mentioned, muscle relaxants, uh, some of the medicines used for interstitial cystitis, like tricyclic antidepressants, and even anti-seizure medications. So a whole host of different remedies that can be used. Unfortunately, none of them are uh, FDA approved for the treatment of these conditions. There are unconventional therapies, whether it be acupuncture or extracorporeal shockwave uh, treatment. Uh, extracorporeal shockwave treatment is something relatively new where uh, little mini shockwaves are given usually through the perineum, that region between the uh, scrotum and the anus, to uh, improve pain. In certain very selective cases, nerve disentrapment surgery can be performed, and even prostate massage to they perhaps remove some of the uh, prostatic secretions can have some um, uh, favorable impact for, again, uh, a certain group of patients who perhaps are not responding to other forms of care. But in summary, uh, as I mentioned earlier, earlier on in this uh, symposium, uh, chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, and all these pelvic pain syndromes are much more common than one might imagine. Uh, the symptoms vary quite a bit. Some patients just have sexual side effects. Some patients uh, seem to really have a great deal of pain associated with these problems. Uh, it's important to keep in mind, all of us to keep in mind, that these uh, problems can have a significant impact on the quality of life. Uh, we are always looking for pelvic floor dysfunction in patients because that's a quick, simple thing to uh, address. And to keep in mind that very simple therapies, of course, can result in profound improvements. So again, I thank you for your attention and have a great day.